In verse 1, we see here in Hebrews chapter 2, Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest we drift away. And if you're just joining us in our study through Hebrews and you want to know why the word therefore is therefore, then you're going to have to revisit or actually visit the studies through Hebrews chapter 1, which you can find out this segueing point into chapter 2 is all about. But he says we give the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard, lest we drift away. And if there was ever a word for the church today, it would be paid extra attention to what God's word says. Because the lies of Satan are very deceitful. He's very cunning. They're very misleading. And so the church needs to pay extra heed to what the word of God says. And we have the words of the law and the prophets and the Psalms. But we know from our study in Hebrews that God has now chosen to speak to us through his son, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 11, it says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth profession is made unto salvation. In verse 11 it says, For the scriptures say, Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. And Romans 10, 13 says, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever you are, wherever you may be, if you call on the name of the Lord, the Lord will answer you and the Lord will save you and he will hear your prayer. But it is incumbent upon the body of Christ, upon the pastors and teachers of the church to preach the unadulterated word of God, the truth as it is without compromise. For it says in verse 14 of Romans 10, how shall they then call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard, and how shall they hear without a preacher, without somebody to tell them the truth of God's word? How are they expected to believe in something that they have never heard of? So Jesus, he alone has the words of life because he is the way to heaven. He is the truth in the world of lies. He is the provider of eternal life for a world that is dying in its sin. In Matthew chapter 24, verses 9 through 14, Jesus said, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Jesus speaking to his disciples, to his followers, about what the world would look like before the end, before Jesus comes back. I wonder upon reading this list of things that were descriptors of the last days, what stood out to you? People betraying one another, friends who thought they were friends, family members turning on each other, people hating one another. How about the false prophets that are rising up in the church and deceiving people, telling them that they can live in sin and still go to heaven? How about lawlessness abounding? You look around at the world today, it doesn't take you long to figure out that lawlessness has abounded. Or what about this? that the love of many would grow cold. Have you noticed that there's been a lot of cooling off in the church? Have you noticed that the fire of the Holy Spirit has been getting quenched because of sin? Self-seeking, self-centeredness, the place where every evil thing dwells within the church comes from that place of self-seeking. And the church is losing its fervency. It's losing its purity. It's losing its love for the Lord and for the word of the Lord. And it's losing its fire. And it's all because Christians or professing Christians or the church are no longer taking heed to the word of God. 
They're making it up as they go. They're creating their own belief system. Here we have this exhortation, this encouragement from God's word. Pay extra attention to what God's word says. Know it for yourself. Study it. Apply it. In Psalm 119, verse 9, it says, How can a young man cleanse his way? And the answer is by taking heed according to your word. For you and me today, the church, how can we cleanse our way? How can we live righteously and purely and with holiness before the Lord by taking extra heed to what God's word says. Yet today, there's a very small fraction of Christians that are in the church that actually read the Bible outside of going to church on Sunday. So we read, give more earnest heed. It is particularly difficult being a Christian today. It's, I think, even more difficult being a Christian trying to raise your children unto the Lord in this day and age because there are so many voices and there is so much information and there are so many things that you have to be aware of and combat and deal with and address. You can't just live a normal, let's just have a nice little normal life. There is no such thing, it would seem, any longer with the impact of social media and YouTube and different media outlets where there are so many deceptions being marketed to our children. There are so many things that we're being influenced by. And if we're careful, we can watch out for those things, but more often is the case is that we're not careful and we end up having alternative things from the Word of God and the leading of the Holy Spirit having a much larger and more impactful voice in our lives. So the Word of God instructs us and teaches us the way that we should go. The Word of God, the lamp unto your feet and the light unto your path. As you might be wondering, well, Garrett, what do I do? Or maybe you've asked that question of other people. Well, what's the right thing? What's pleasing to the Lord? How do I take this bad situation and get something good out of it? How do I know truly what the best decision is? It's found in the Word of God. The Word of God will give you direction. The Word of God will show you what is truth. The Word of God will show you where you find life and life abundantly because it's found in Jesus alone. And no matter how difficult it may be, and I already shared with you, yeah, it's difficult, and you will find that you experience great difficulties at times, that when you honor the Lord, He will honor you. And the Holy Spirit fills your lives the living Word of God also acts as a filter for our ears, for our eyes, for our thoughts, and our feelings. The heart can be deceptive. How many of us at some point in our life have believed a lie, something that wasn't true, or we're plagued in our mind by thoughts that lead us to, this, to depression or discouragement? How many times have we found ourselves in a place where we built up this whole entire scenario and it actually wasn't even real? They weren't really thinking that and that actually never happened. And even furthermore, that wasn't true. The Word of God filters out that which is not of the Lord. The Word of God allows you to have a point of recognition where you see things for what they really are in light of God's standards, in light of God's holiness, and in light of God's truth. You hold them side by side. Your scenario, your situation, your view on life, your comment section, and you hold it next to what does God's Word tell me? As a church, do we delight in the Word of the Lord? Are we taking heed to what it says, or are you living recklessly, being tossed to and fro as you're ping-ponged from one end to the other with every new philosophy, every new belief system that comes along? Jeremiah the prophet said this in chapter 15, verse 16. He says, Lord, your words were found, and I ate them. And your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart, for I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. That when you ingest the word of God, when you study it and when you read it and when you delight in it, you'll find that great joy comes from spending time with the, 
with the Lord. That there's power there. And that it purifies your mind. And so all of a sudden, when you're starting to think to yourself, you know what, I've done some pretty bad things. I must be too far gone for God to reach me. Oh, you know what, I, I've done some pretty terrible things in my life. I don't know if God could ever love me. You know, I, I wonder if, you know, I, I've made too many mistakes to the point where, you know, I can't have any life that is worth living after this point, so I might as well, you know, just end it. And maybe you're even contemplating suicide, you're wrestling with depression, you're wondering if there's purpose, there is hope in this life. And then you look to God's word and you find that God knows everything about you. He created you to know him. He created you uniquely and with a purpose. He created you to be a part of his great plan. He's not caught off guard like I said last week when we make mistakes. He saw it all in advance. He knew your feelings. He knows your thoughts are far off. He wrote your life in a book before there was even a world to live a life in. That is the God who created you. That is the God who loves you. But back in Matthew 24, regarding what Jesus had to say about false teachers rising up in the last days, the church, and I would say we today, need to pay extra attention to the genuine article, which is the Bible. So that you might be able to differentiate between the counterfeit and that which is the real deal. We have a lot of people in the church today, young and old and in between, that are heavily influenced by the world. And even in most cases, it would seem they're more under the influence of a social media influencer than they are by the Holy Spirit. More influenced by somebody that might have a lot of followers than they are by the Word of God. And what happened over the last 10 to 15 years as YouTube started to explode, you started to see people that knew nothing about anything but had a ton of followers, and now they had a large voice of speaking non-truths to people. But they would look at now, oh, they must have some sort of authority because look at their followers, and they replaced the word of God for the number of followers on their channel. That's why you must take extra heed to the word of God. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The emphasis has to be for the Christian, what does God's word say? This word, take earnest heed, in the Greek, earnest means more abundantly or to a degree that it is above all other things. You can't run from sin. You can't run from the world. You can't run from wickedness. You can't live in a bubble. You're going to see these things. Our kids see these things. They hear these things. But the Word of God has an answer for every single one of them. The Word of God, because it does not change, and because God, in His omniscience, part of His deity, outside of time, He is able to speak truth into any scenario at any given point in history. There are a lot of things vying for our attention. Speaking even more than we realize into our lives subconsciously, you know, so much new age movement, self-help, love yourself more kind of things have permeated into the church where people don't even realize how off it is what they're saying. So stay connected to God's word. Why do we need to do that? So that we don't drift away, he says. You know, growing up by the beach here in Southern California, Living in Hawaii for a year and a half or so in between college and really that was a nice chapter in my life, I have to say. But so surf culture has always been a part of my life. One of the first things that my parents taught me about ocean safety was about rip currents. Strong currents that could suck you out to sea or down the coast. And when you're a young guy, and I know this because I revisited it when I was teaching my boys ocean safety. You know, you're already intimidated by the ocean. It's massive and there are these loud crashing waves and you're wondering, you know, what's swimming out there? What lives out there? It's very dangerous. And when you hear about getting sucked out to sea or, you know, losing your bearings because you didn't realize that you drifted north or south down the beach depending upon the current, you kind of come to the conclusion in your own little mind, I don't want to mess with the ocean. But sooner or later, it's inevitable, you will get stuck in a rip. You'll get stuck in a rip current. 
Just like Huntington Beach or Newport or down south here in Trestles, wherever. There are things that are in life that are meant to suck you into them. To take you off course. To get you so far drifted that you don't even realize that it happened. And then what do you do when something seems so powerful that you can't conquer it? Or actually you realize this is actually greater than me. It is greater than what I can handle myself. What am I to do? How am I to navigate this? See, the word of God now gives you your navigational charts for life. You got sucked into something. You drifted away. But here's the course correction. Just like when you would set up a landmark at the beach, one of the first things, my, my, my Technicolor dream coat towel, that was my landmark. That massive, massive towel. I would know if I had drifted north or if I had drifted south just by looking at that landmark. That landmark doesn't change. That landmark is always there. I can always look to it and know exactly where I am. I'm either too far north, I'm too far south. I know because that never changes. Often. People will move the goalposts, so to speak, and then you never know what is right and what is wrong because that landmark actually was not a landmark. It was something that was just moved back and forth wherever it suited the person for that given point in time. And so you never know where you're at. The church's landmark is the Word of God. And if I have drifted, or maybe there are some of you here today that have drifted from the Lord, the Word of God tells you how to get back on track with Him. Whether you're getting pulled out into something or whether you're drifting. And the drift is very, very subtle. If you don't have a landmark, next thing you know, you have drifted a mile down the beach and you're like, where am I and how did I get there? I didn't even notice that I was going in that direction. There are some of you here today that have been sucked into sin. And it's got a strong hold on you. And just like that current that sucks you out to sea, it's sucking you deeper and deeper into that lifestyle, into that habit, into that way of thinking, that way of living. And you might have tried with all of your might, I'm going to get out of this. I'm going to swim as hard as I possibly can. I'm going to try to be a better person. I'm going to try to do good things. I'm going to try to do something different next time. And you find that the only thing that is happening in all of that is you're getting exhausted and now you start to sink into it deeper than before. But isn't it amazing when some truth comes by? When the truth of the word of God would tell you as somebody stuck in a rip current, you can't swim against it. You have to actually swim sideways until you swim out of it and then you can come back. You're gonna wear yourself out trying to save yourself. How about doing what will save you? How about surrendering your life to Jesus Christ? How about having him forgive you of your sins? How about you stop trying to earn your way to heaven and fight against everything in your own strength only to fail and have Jesus lift you up, Jesus rescue you, Jesus change your life? How about that? If you choose to come to the Lord, he will remove the fear. He will give you peace. And a Christian will drift from holiness and from purity, and from the power of the Holy Spirit at work in their lives if they allow the world to lead them away from the Lord. No drifting away, church. No drifting away. And in verse 2, he says, For if the word spoken through angels proves steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape? If we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. As we've been studying, Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the law. 
Everything that was taught, those things that were, were revealed supernaturally were only foreshadowing the great work of salvation through Jesus. So the Old Testament proved steadfast. Everything up until the point of Jesus' birth and his ministry, his death and resurrection and the birth of the church has proven to be 100% true and trustworthy. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 18, I truly say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. He fulfilled all things, Jesus did. And he said, there's not going to be one dot of an eye from the law that will pass away or that will fail. And so what the author of Hebrews is saying here, everything in the Old Testament is true. All the commandments of the Lord are just and righteous. And that means that there has always been consequences for sin. There always has been, and there will always be until this world ends. And at that time, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. We rejoice because there will be no more sin and no more sorrow, no more death, no more cancers, no more hate, no more wickedness, no more evil. That is going to be a great day. But until that day comes, disobedience to the Lord must be understood as something that will not only hurt you, but will hurt those around you. Because sin is missing the mark of God's perfect standard of righteous living. Because we reap what we sow. We get a return on our investment. In Galatians 6, verses 7 through 8, it says, don't be deceived. Or we could say, don't believe the lie. God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, he will also reap. Whatever a man invests in, he will also return, have a return on that investment. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And so if Jesus is the fulfillment of everything in the Old Testament, the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, how much more so will every single person give an account for what they have done, be it wicked or be it righteous? The word spoken through angels proves steadfast. Verse two, every transgression and disobedience received a just reward. So if that has been true until Jesus, how much more so now that we have given, been given this opportunity to have such a great salvation, to be saved from our sins. See, the gospel of Jesus Christ does not allow people off the hook for neglecting his message. You know, we speak of God's love, we speak of God's forgiveness. Those things both are real, but they don't hit as hard as they should until you understand God's hate for sin and judgment upon all that is evil. It's because of the terrible reality of God's judgment that makes the message of the gospel so much more amazing. It's the consequences of sin that makes God's forgiveness so much more fantastic. Even though I was dead in my sins, God forgave me. He raised me up. He changed my life. You weren't getting off the hook back then, and you are even more so not getting off the hook today. You know, Paul spoke of sin that leads to death. He also spoke of the work of Jesus to deliver us from it in 2 Corinthians 1.10, who says, Jesus, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he still will deliver us. How were we delivered from such a great death? Well, it was because of such a great message of the gospel. A great salvation conquered the great death. In Matthew chapter 13, Verses 41 through 43, Jesus says, The Son of Man will send out his angels. As you remember from our last study, Jesus created the angels. They are his messengers, and they do his work. And so the Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend 
and he will also gather out those who practice lawlessness, and they will cast them into a furnace of fire, and there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus' own, own words. That there will be a sifting that takes place. Where on one hand, the Lord will say, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. And on the other hand, he'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. Where would you like to be? Which line are you lining up in? I'll tell you right now, as Jesus says, let he who has ears to hear, let him hear. I'm like, Lord, I'm listening. Lord, tell me what I need to do. Lord, show me the way. What is truth? What is righteous? I don't want anything to do with practicing with that which is against God. I don't want to touch wailing and gnashing of teeth with a you know, 50-foot pole. And especially not a fiery furnace of hell. Though some people do get pretty close, as Jude wrote in chapter 1, verses 22 through 23. And he says, And some have compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments defiled by the flesh. You know, some of us have known better. We knew what was wrong, but we did it anyway. And we have felt the tickle of those flames of fire over the gates of hell. And that's not a pleasant place to be. Lord, have mercy. Lord, forgive me. Some through compassion. Some, like, hey man, the reality is that God will judge sin and you don't want to end up in that category of being judged. So take heed. Listen to what God's word says. It doesn't matter what they're saying outside there. They all are going to say whatever they're going to say. What does God's word tell you? And so that begs the question in verse 3, and I think appropriately so, we read it. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? How will I escape if I neglect God's plan for saving me from my sin? What is it? Have you ever wondered? What, what is it that I put my hope in? What is it that I hope in to save me from the judgment of God? I think we could all say, I have a desire to escape God's judgment. If I don't have to get busted for my sin, then I would love to receive that mercy and forgiveness, that right relationship with the Lord. We desire to, to escape spending eternity in hell instead of heaven. We, we desire to escape the clutches of sin and the control of the lust of the flesh in our lives in this present age. I would say we desire to be clothed with the righteousness that comes from Jesus alone. So knowing that the word of God endures forever, and if the word spoken in times past through the law and through the prophets has proved to be true, then how much more so will the word of God's only son be true? This is the condemnation that has come into the world, Jesus said, John 3, that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil, period. He just got done telling Nicodemus, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever, whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. He just said that. And then he transitions into, and this now is the condemnation that has come into the world. Because the reality is this. People reject the great salvation because they love evil. There's no mincing words, Jesus did not, nor will I. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. I like doing what's evil. I like doing what's wrong. And so I reject God's great plan of salvation. 
But what the author of Hebrews is telling you, have you seen how it went for those in the Old Testament that predated Jesus who went against God's commands? God's commandments have stood the test of time. They have proven to be true over and over and over and over again in history documents for, for docu documents those things for us. So how much more so now? Do you think you can escape a great judgment without a great salvation? And God being holy in all of his ways will not and cannot let sin go by without being dealt with. But have you noticed, and I'm sure you probably have picked up on this, that there are so many ways that people try to escape God's judgment. So many ways. One that's very popular is that some just refuse to believe that God exists. Because if they can rationalize his non-existence, then they don't have to deal with his commandments or his judgment of sin. And this really starts with just denying him as a creator through the evolutionary process. If God didn't create, then God didn't command. And if God didn't command, then I don't have to obey. And if I don't have to obey, then I just get to do whatever I want, and that's how I escape God's judgment. Some elevate themselves to the place of God where they determine for themselves what they want to believe or how they want to believe, or in essence, they decide for themselves how they'll make it to heaven or how they'll make up for their sin. Well, I've done wrong things, and this is how I've devised a plan to counteract those things. Some will pick and choose which parts of different religions they want to believe, and then they create their own belief system. Well, I'll take a little bit of this, and I'll take a little bit of that, throw some of those things out, but I like some of those things. I'll bring those in. Some will, because they're still in touch with their God-given conscience, will try to be a good person, and that quote-unquote good person status comes by comparing themselves to bad people next to them. I'm a good person because I am better than her. And I'm not as bad as him. And so that's how I will be righteous before the Lord, by being not as bad as them and better than those over there. And so that's how I will obtain my good person card, and hopefully that will get me into heaven. But in every single case, there is just a denial of facts. Small little problem. Nature sociology, history, archaeology, prophecy. There is only one way to escape the condemnation or the judgment of God, and that is through faith in Jesus. Nobody escaped prior to Jesus. Nobody escapes after Jesus. You will all give an account for what you have done with this great salvation. In Matthew 14, verses 45 through 46, this is a tremendous, tremendous story. It's a parable. Parables were stories used to communicate spiritual truths or deeper meanings. Jesus said, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who then when he had found one pearl of great price, he went and sold all that he had and he bought it. What does that tell you? If you were to sell everything you had to buy one thing, would you say that there was a lot of value attributed to that? I sold my house, I sold my cars, I sold everything that I owned. I sold all my baseball cards, I sold my you know, video game consoles, I sold my motorcycle, I sold my helicopter, I sold whatever it is that I have. I sold all my Lego sets, whatever it may be. This was worth it. The kingdom of heaven, salvation, is worth it. Jesus said, what would it profit you if you gain everything that this world has to offer and you lose your very soul? That which will live on after this earth is melted with a fervent heat and a new heaven and a new earth is instituted, you will have lost the most important thing to you. I wonder what it may be today that you need to get rid of in order to acquire the most prized possession you could acquire, which is salvation through Jesus Christ. That pearl of great price, this is salvation. This is the kingdom of heaven. Nothing that you have can substitute for that. And so it says in verse four, our final verse for this morning, 
God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his will. God birthed the church through the power of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 5, verse 12, it says, And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. The Holy Spirit at full display, the power of God at work as the church began to take root and it began to grow. God bore witness. God bore witness to his son Jesus calling. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved son. Hear what he has to say. God also bore witness to the work of the church. This is actually today what you're experiencing, what you're a part of as we gather together to worship the Lord and study his word. You're a part of God bearing witness. Even to this day. It's a mark of his sovereignty. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We're a part of that truth, that promise that is still in effect today. It's in effect this very moment. You are living proof of God bearing witness to the message of the gospel, his beloved son, the work of the Holy Spirit, and this entity that we know as his church. Jesus is the head of the church. The Holy Spirit worked through the, through the apostles in the birth of the church, through signs and wonders. And the Holy Spirit is still working today. Andrew Murray said this, and I quote, the existence of his church is his standing sign and wonder, the proof of his divine power. Not to take heed, to neglect the great salvation is nothing less than despising God himself. End of quote. God's standing power is on display through Vision City Church and through every single church that bears the name of Jesus and is committed to teaching without compromise his word. But not only that, God set his seal upon those that were in the church by giving them the Holy Spirit. You no longer have that God-shaped void because God has now filled it with his Holy Spirit. He has gifted you his Spirit to show you the things that are truths in God's word. He's also give, gifted you with gifts. We're coming into that season of Christmas, you know, where we talk about gift giving and all of that. And it's great to get presents and all of that. But the Lord is giving you different gifts of the Holy Spirit. Each of you have one. I'd like to read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And you can listen along or if you like to turn to ch chapter 12 and we're going to read verses 5 through 11. It says, there are differences of ministries but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Holy Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Meaning that the Holy Spirit has gifted each of you with a spiritual gift so that the church might be blessed because of it. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Holy Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. Verse 9, 1 Corinthians 12, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. In verse 11, but one and the same Holy Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. The Holy Spirit at work in the church, at work in you. Some will say, and well, unless you exercise this particular spiritual gift, you're not truly saved. What did you just read from God's word? It is one Holy Spirit, and he gifts those gifts to his followers, those who have faith in Jesus. It's 
really safe to say that any follower of Jesus filled with the Holy Spirit may at any time exercise any of the gifts of the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit should will. And that's pretty exciting. That's pretty cool. And so we're living proof of the standing power of God at work in his church and through his people, you and me. The fact that we're here today, we are the confirmation, we are the living epistles, having had the laws and commands of God written on our hearts. That God is still at work in his church. The end may be close, but it is not yet here. And so there is a lot of work to be done. For some of you that aren't walking with the Lord, it's probably a pretty good thing that God hasn't come back already. Because then it would have been too late. That's why he says, church, take extra heed to what God's word says. Extra heed. Make it your priority above all other things. You're going to have a lot of voices that you're going to hear from different things in this world, but make the word of God paramount. If you're here and you've walked away from the Lord and you're one of those that would be categorized as, yeah, I drifted. Just like that guy bodyboarding over at Huntington Beach. I, I just got, I went way, way away and I didn't even realize it. And I look back at my life years down the road and I didn't realize how far I had gone. But thank God that he has given you your way back. That if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus personally as your Lord and Savior, we're going to be having communion today, the first Sunday of November already. Where we remember why we celebrate communion because of what Jesus did. And if you're here at this church today, and it just so happens to be that you're here today, we are not good at playing church. I am actually pretty terrible at doing sugar-coated messages. And I'm absolutely not sorry for that at all. The Word of God gives you exactly what you need, when you need it. And so I invite those of you that may not know Jesus personally to receive that forgiveness of sins. To begin that relationship with the God who created you to know him today. For those of you that have drifted, come back to him. For those of you that are walking with the Lord, stay committed to your faith. Take extra heed to the word of God. Do not neglect this great of salvation. The word of God has stood the test of time. God's commandments are faithful and true, and they will not pass away. Nobody escaped them before Jesus, and we're certainly not escaping them after Jesus' work on the cross. So today, you choose. You decide. What are you going to do with this great salvation? There is nothing that will cover the great death and the great judgment and the great grasp and powerful clutches of sin, but a great salvation through our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Would you please join with me as we pray? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's living, it's powerful. Lord, it meets us exactly where we're at. It gives us exactly what we need, when we need it. And Lord, I pray with every eye closed and every head bowed for those here that may not know you personally, for those that may be watching this from some other place that maybe have been seeking or trying to find out answers or discern what is truth. I pray that today, Lord, you would speak to their heart in such a real, powerful, and clear way that they would know without a shadow of a doubt that they need to commit their life to you. And Lord, I pray for those that might be here or might be watching that have drifted away, Lord, that they would come back to you today. Lord, maybe they've drifted in their heart for some time now and it's just recently started to make its way out in lifestyle choices. Maybe there's been some things happening privately for a long time, but now sin has been now allowed to have a place. It's given birth, so to speak, and spread. I pray, Lord, that this drifting away from you would stop today. 
And with every eye closed and head bowed, if you're here and you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior and you know you've sinned, you know you've done things that are wrong, but you like to be forgiven of all that sin. You like to experience having a personal relationship with God. And very simply, I'd like you just to raise your hand and say, yes, that's me. I'd like to give my life to Jesus. Would you hold your hand up? Because I'm going to lead you in a very simple prayer. Just hold your hand up. God bless you over there. I see you there too. And if you have drifted away from the Lord and you need to come back to him today, is that you? Is your heart beating out of your chest? Is that you that the Holy Spirit is speaking to saying, that's you, my son. That's you, my daughter. You've drifted but I still love you and I'm still giving you this chance. Come back to me today. If you need to recommit your life to the Lord, would you just raise your hand as well and say, yes, I'd like to recommit my life to Jesus. And I'm gonna lead you in a very simple prayer. But you have to hold your hand up so I can pray for you, so I can see you. I'm gonna pray for you right now. And even if you're sitting there in front of your computer or your phone and you're watching this, you can raise your hand. I'm gonna pray for you right now. Father, I pray for these that have raised their hands. I pray, Lord, for those that have felt the tug on their heart from the Holy Spirit. Lord, that today they would not run from it. They would not neglect it. They would not shut it down. They would not resist it. They would not say no to it. I pray that they would receive it, Lord. Move by your Spirit now. And again, still while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, if you're here, and you need to get right with the Lord, whether you raised your hand or not, I'm gonna lead you in a very simple prayer and I'm gonna ask that you would repeat this prayer after me and mean it in your heart and pray, Dear Heavenly Father, I know that I have sinned, but I ask that you would forgive me of my sin and fill me with your Holy Spirit. I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you sent Jesus to die on the cross for me. And I thank you that you have forgiven me of all my sin. Would you fill me with your love and your joy and your peace and your strength? For I give you my life today. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says that those who are in Christ are a new creation. The old things have passed away and behold, all has been made new. And at the conclusion of our service today, if you prayed that prayer, Pastor Jonathan and the team would love to welcome you to the family, welcome you back. Maybe it's been a while. We'd love to pray for you and help you jumpstart this new walk with the Lord that starts today. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious unto you. And may he lift up his countenance upon you and just give you an amazing week as you walk with the Lord. God bless you.